I want to welcome everybody here. Thank you for taking the time to sit through the class, for showing the interest in the class. Um, for those of you who do not know, my name is Jim Bollinger. I have a channel, Do Right Fabrication. I have a shop at the house at home on my farm. I'm a full-time firefighter paramedic for the City of Orlando Fire Department. My shop at home, I do a little bit of machining, a little bit of welding, actually a lot of welding. I teach for Lincoln. I started doing that many, many years ago. Uh, this is the class I teach a couple times a year. Uh, we usually will teach about 1,500 students the same class. What I want to do is teach you the basics. I can teach you what you do right, wrong, or indifferent, how to fix the problem so that you can continue on that learning process. Real quickly, I want to talk about the safety. Those of you who do not know that when you weld, when you arc weld, whether it's MIG, TIG, or stick weld, you create radiation. I don't get freaked out, it's not gamma radiation, but it is light radiation, okay? Just like sitting in a tanning bed or going outside if you haven't been in the sun all winter, it will burn you, and it will burn you bad enough to put you in the hospital. If you watch a lot of these hot rod shows, the guys get on there and they close their eyes and tack weld, that will hurt you. That will burn the skin on your face and around your eyes, even though your eyes are closed, it will burn you. Raise your hand if you've ever been burned. Notice that there's a lot of experienced welders in here that say they've been burned. The reason I tell you that is Lincoln is really, really big on safety. The way we protect ourselves is with jackets, long, long pants, uh, not nylon, because you know nylon melts when sparks hit it, right? I don't need to paint that picture for you. Cotton, cotton duck works real well. Jeans are excellent. Leather is the choice. But on a day like today, who wants to wear a leather jacket? So we usually go to the cotton duck. Safety glasses all at all times, safety glasses, even underneath your welding helmet. I know that sounds weird. A lot of times those sparks can fly around, especially if you're MIGGIN, and they can get inside your helmet and it's just another level of protection. Gloves, gloves of choice, they're different for whatever you do. And MIG gloves are different than stick gloves, but doesn't mean you can't TIG with stick gloves. It's just very difficult. It's all about dexterity. Where I want to spend most of the time talking to you is about this. These Lincoln helmets, are ANSI rated for impact resistance. They also, all the electronic auto darkening helmets turn off, so they're also a grinder shield. You don't have to lift your helmet, you can just pick the grinder up and go right to grinding. There are a lot of companies that make good helmets besides Lincoln Electric. I'd like it if you buy all Lincoln Electric products because it keeps me doing these TIG welding seminars. I don't care whose helmet you buy, but if you're getting into welding, spend money on a good helmet. Has anybody in here ever been welder flashed? Ever met anybody in here been welder flashed bad? Imagine waking up in the middle of the night, somebody holding your eyeball open and pouring beach sand in your eye. That's what it feels like. It, luckily it heals, but it is a sunburn on the surface of your eye. And anybody can uh, probably don't need to paint you much more of a picture of why that would be real dangerous for us. Uh, TIG welding, we're all here to learn about TIG welding. Can somebody tell me what TIG welding is? Just call it out. Tungsten inert gas welding. Who in here has heard of heliarc welding? How many people have ever seen somebody heliarc weld? Oh, I got a couple. How many people have seen somebody TIG weld? I make a liar out of some of y'all. TIG welding is Heliarc welding. Heliarc is a trademark brand name uh, by the Lindy Corporation right around the time or just before World War II. They figured out how to use helium gas and an arc welder and weld aluminum with a real high quality weld. They trademarked it. They called it Heliarc welding. Heliarc is TIG welding. Somebody called it out correctly. They said tungsten inert gas welding. That is correct. The American Welding Society calls it GTAW, gas tungsten arc welding. So like everybody, there's three or four names for it, but it is all the exact same process. What's different about TIG than MIG or stick? In MIG and in stick, our electrode is consumed in the weld process. In MIG, it's our MIG wire, that's our electrode. In stick welding, it's our electrode we stick in the stick stinger, and as we weld, that electrode becomes our filler metal. In TIG, our electrode, in a perfect world, notice I said in a perfect world, because as beginners, it's not a perfect world. In TIG, the electrode does not ever become consumed. It should theoretically last almost forever. But every one of you is gonna dip it into the puddle, because that's part of learning, okay? Our filler metal is added manually, in a manual process. We also, our heat, in our MIG machine or our stick machine at home, we can set our voltage and our wire feed speed on our MIG machine or our stick machine, we'll go set it at 90 amps. I'm gonna go out and fix a set of disc arrows on something. 90 amps, go out there, put a 7018 rod in, and just go slap some weld on it, right? Whatever you set that machine at, when you squeeze the trigger or strike the arc is what you get. In TIG, in TIG welding, we can control that heat in the middle of our welding process. So if we're too hot or too cold, we can fix it. We can fix it right now. Now, TIG uses 
only inert gases. How many people in here are MIG weld? How many are MIG welders, got MIG welders at home? Wow, about half of you. You most likely at home use something called 7525 welding gas. Some people, is a trade name, Cargon, everybody tries to sell it under a different name, but it's 75% argon, 25% CO2. The CO2 in that gas, in that setup, is what's called an active gas. We actually are using it to change something in our weld process. In TIG, we don't want to change anything. In TIG welding, we want to leave the alloy exactly like it is. When we MIG, we need to wet that, that puddle in. We're using the CO2 to wet it, and we're also using it to float out some of the bad stuff that's in our weld, some of the oxides, the oxidation. In TIG, it's always an inert gas. Let's, um, let's talk about inert gases for a minute. Can somebody name them? Does anybody know what they are? Just call them out. Helium's one. Argon's two. Hydrogen's not an inert. Nitrogen's not an inert. Go ahead. They're all the nobles. Yes, that is correct. So we got helium and argon so far. Xenon's one. Krypton's one. Radon. Radon's the other one. They're all inert gases. And what an inert gas is, that means that it does not have any interest in the weld puddle or anything that's going on in the weld process. It's gonna cover that weld and keep the oxygen away from it. The two gases that we're gonna use in TIG almost exclusively are helium and argon. But helium costs three times as much, okay? So you can see right away, it's probably not gonna be our number one choice when we're building whatever we're building. A lot of people ask where do the gases come from? Most of the gases we can make. We can pump the atmosphere under extreme pressure. We can uh, refrigerate it, get it really, really, really cold. And at certain specific temperatures, those gases will liquefy and then they can pump that liquid off. At absolute zero is negative 459 degrees. Helium becomes a liquid at uh, negative 453 degrees. Absolute zero is theoretical. We've never actually been able to achieve it because all atoms stop moving at absolute zero. So, to try to freeze helium down to get a liquid out of helium would be extremely costly. Does anybody know how we get it? Does anybody know? He is correct. He said natural gas. We mine it. When they drill for oil or natural gas, helium is on top of the mines. We like helium because it's lighter than air, right? How would that help us? Overhead welding, maybe up on the top side of a tank? That could be helpful, right? But there's really one key thing in helium that we really, really like, one. It's 1.7 times hotter in TIG welding than argon. Meaning, if we have the same exact settings on our machine and we just switch to helium gas from argon gas, we get 1.7 times more heat out of the helium. Where that comes in for us is think big pieces, cylinder heads, intake manifolds, big giant heat sinks that we have a hard time heating up because one of the properties we like of aluminum is high thermal conductivity. It gets rid of heat really fast but we've got to keep that heat to keep that aluminum to 1200 degrees to keep it melted. So we can, we can get it done just by adding helium. Now let me give you a real world example for me how that, that came into play. I work for a TV show here in the US, um, Extreme Makeover Home Edition. I did about 24 episodes of that show. They came to me, they said, can you weld up a really nice aluminum handrail for the, for the stair banister? I said, absolutely. We got on it, we started working through the night to get it done. The base plates, all we could come up with was three eighths plate. We had it milled on the corners to give it a nice chamfer, make it look real nice. But I had to weld that onto an inch and a half square tube to make the uprights. The high for the day was 15 degrees that day. I brought a little tiny inverter with me. I can do that weld all day long at home in Florida. But because it was so cold that day, I couldn't keep enough heat into that aluminum because it was giving away the heat. We tried putting torches on it. We tried preheating it. We even tried heating the table we were on with torches, trying to warm the table up because it was helping pull the heat out of it. We just couldn't make what I considered a good, a good looking and a good solid weld to put in someone's house. I wouldn't accept that. So I called the local weld supplier and he brought me out a bottle of helium, slid a bottle of helium in there and I had to back the machine off because now I had enough heat. And that's just a little trick I try to throw out there to you, especially if somebody brings a cylinder head and says, hey, can you fix this? or uh, like any, any thick piece of aluminum that your machine just can't keep up with because of that thermal conductivity. The big thing with argon that we like about it is it's heavier than air. That means when we're welding on a weld table that, that argon will want to tend to hang around. We've got to use three times as much helium, three times as much gas that costs three times as much as the argon. 
That gas wants to go away. That helium, like every kid's helium balloon, it wants to go up in the air. So we've really got to hammer the helium to it. It's already costly as it is. Argon wants to hang around our, our table. Does anybody know how that argon could create a deadly situation for us? Somebody said asphyxiation, that is correct. Late on a Saturday afternoon, you get a knock or a phone call and your buddy calls you and you, he says, hey, I borrowed my dad's John boat and I was goofing around on the trailer and I knocked a hole in the bottom of it. We could see this really happening, right? Is there any way you could show me your mad skills on TIG welding aluminum and patch this little hole? So he brings it over and you attempt to climb into the bottom of the boat and weld the hole up. That will kill you dead as a hammer, okay? Not because you did anything wrong, but because you stick your head into the bottom of a vessel that's holding a gas that's heavier than air that displaces all of the oxygen. There's nothing wrong with you, you're just not breathing. Even though you're breathing, you're not bringing in any oxygen. It's a confined space, even though it doesn't seem like a confined space. Now, how can we fix that problem? You could use helium, that is correct, but a boat's gonna be very thin, and helium is gonna be tricky because it's already hot. You could do it from the bottom, but unless you're a very accomplished TIG welder, I wouldn't suggest trying to weld a boat from the bottom yet. You could vent it. He said vent it, vent it is correct, but you have to be careful not to disturb the, the air column, the gas column that's around the weld. How about we just turn the boat on its side in the garage? All the gas goes out on the floor and it's gone. Uh, the reason I give you that example is because I don't want any of you guys to go home. I want you to be, to be thoughtful of the gas is heavier than air. It does not harm you to breathe it. Argon is in our atmosphere. We breathe it all the time. It is not poisonous, but it, it will, however, displace all of the oxygen. And without oxygen, we all know what happens in three to five minutes. Standard cubic feet an hour is how we rate our gas flow. Gas flow is necessary because, again, we have to keep all of the atmosphere away from our weld. We cannot let any oxygen or nitrogen from our atmosphere get into our weld puddle. Measurement term we use is standard cubic feet per hour. The flow meters that are on your machine. We put this on here just so you know kind of where to start. For argon, about 15 to 20 cubic feet per hour. Helium, remember we need three times as much. So we said 15 to 20 for argon. Helium is 45 to 60 cubic feet per hour. So we gotta get, dump a lot more helium. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed what you saw here today. Be sure to subscribe to my channel and like us on Facebook. Please, somewhere down below here is a link. We've got a lot more really cool stuff coming. Is that right, camera guy? Is there a link down there? Send me a comment. I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Click whatever link. Click something. See you soon.